he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has charged all our guilt to him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent in front of its shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away without a fair trial and without justice, and of his generation, who even cared? So he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of the rebellion of my people. They would have assigned him a grave with the wicked, but he was given a grave with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, and no deceit was in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and allow him to suffer. Because you made his life a guilt offering, he will see offspring. He will prolong his days, and the Lord's gracious plan will succeed in his hand. After his soul experiences anguish, he will see the light of life. He will provide satisfaction. Through their knowledge of him, my just servant will justify the many, for he himself carried their guilt. Therefore I will give him an allotment among the great, and with the strong he will share plunder, because he poured out his life to death, and he let himself be counted with rebellious sinners. He himself carried the sin of many, and he intercedes for the rebels.
It is said that it is only natural to hate one's enemies. After all, the reason they are your enemies is because they've done something evil or harmful to you and yours. Our Lord God, too, has his enemies, enemies that he does hate. He hates his enemies of sin and sinners. But his hatred is not like our hate. Our God is love. And so even his hatred leaves, leads him to love. His hate of sin and sinners led him to take on all the sin of the world, even the sins of those who pierced him and nailed him to the tree. When we were sinners, when we were God's hated enemies, God loved us and died for us. If you ever think that you've sinned too much, gone too far, that God cannot love you, that God must only hate you, that he cannot forgive you, then hear what he says to his own murderers in the first word from the cross. Two other men who were criminals were led away with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They cast lots to divide his garments among them. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They, my hands and stand my feet. they divide my garments among them. And he, has lost my he bore the sin of many. And made for the transgressions. Gracious Savior, you did not strike back with revenge against your enemies as they ridiculed and crucified you but prayed for their forgiveness. In your compassion, pardon us for our secret sins and sins we do not discern, and enlighten us to know and do your will. Faith is putting trust in the Savior. Faith is nothing more than looking to the Savior and believing that he is the King, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior. The criminals crucified next to Christ did not have anything to offer, no gifts, no deeds, nothing. The thief that mocked Jesus expected some grand display of power but the thief who repented 
knew that while he was paying the temporal price for his crimes, the Savior next to him was paying the eternal price for his sins. His only plea, that his sins too be forgiven. And at the words and promise of his Savior, faith was implanted into his heart. The second word from the cross. The people stood watching. The rulers were ridiculing him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also made fun of him. Coming up to him, they offered him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription written above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming him, saying, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same condemnation, we are punished justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for what we have done, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Amen, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. All who see me mock me. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Mighty Redeemer, remember us as we walk through the darkest valleys of life and realize that our time on earth is ending. Stay close to us when we feel the pain and loneliness of dying and take away our fears with your certain promise of paradise. Amen. It was a commonly held pious belief that great prophets died on the day that they were conceived. If this is so, then Jesus' crucifixion was March the 25th, the day that 34 years ago before that, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary to announce the birth of Jesus. Jesus shows that He was a human being like us, even in his dying moments, as he suffers the weight of the sins of the whole world. He still cares for his mother. 
Like any son, he loved his mother. And so he wished to make sure that after he was gone, she would still have someone to take care of her, to take his place as her son. For Mary, this sight was undoubtedly more tragic than we could possibly imagine. It's one thing to see our God suffering and dying for us, but for that to be your own son as well. The third word from the cross. Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his own home. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be spoken so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And the sword will pierce your own soul too. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Precious Jesus, when you were presented at the temple as an infant, Simeon prophesied that a sword would pierce your mother's heart. Here, at the foot of the cross, that sword's length has passed. Grant us a faith like your mother's, who, despite all the pain, comes to the foot of the cross to see our salvation. Romans developed crucifixion to be the most torturous death possible so that it would be an instrument of fear to keep their many conquered realms in line and to show that they would not tolerate lawlessness. But despite the immense physical pain that was upon Christ, that pain was an immeasurably tiny fraction compared to the true pain that is stated in his fourth word from the cross. Upon this word, we know that Jesus was suffering our punishment. The punishment that we deserve for our sin is eternal separation from God the source of all goodness, love, and life. Our punishment was upon him. The fourth word from the cross. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. 
About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. In that day, declares the Sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon. Lord Jesus, you endured the horrific penalty of our sins as your Father turned his face from you on the cross. Compel us to see in your sacrifice the dreadful nature of sin and call us to acknowledge the amazing depth of your love. Overcome our shame, dear Savior, and give us grateful faith. Jesus' body and soul had been drained, used up, and dried out like a husk. Paying for our sins had left him in this state. But he knew that he had accomplished his mission, and so to fulfill the word of Scripture, Jesus makes a simple request, a drink, so that he might raise his voice and proclaim his victory. The fifth word from the cross. After this, knowing that everything had now been finished and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So they put a sponge soaked in sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. I am worn out and calling for help. They put gall in my food. Dear Lord, 
Dear Jesus, as our brother on earth, you endured the agony of pain that besieged your body when your sacrifice was complete. Knowing our experiences, hover over us with your care and compassion when our bodies and hearts are hurting. Provide us with strength that we may confess you with confidence and power. wages of sin is death, physical death and eternal death in hell. That is the rightful meed, the payment due to us for our trespasses against God's holy law. But in his love, God sent his own son to be the perfect son for us, and then to send the guilt and sin of all people and of all time crashing down upon him. Not a single sin was left. It was all obliterated by the God-made man for us. The sixth word from the cross. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then, Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem because of the blood of my covenant with you. I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Gracious Redeemer, you paid the full price for our redemption and have released us forever from the hold of Satan, the power of sin, and the fear of death. Protect us from the devil's claim that we need to do more and from the accusation of our consciences that we have not done enough. Lead us to place our entire confidence in you and to live our lives secure in your grace.
God is dead, and we killed him. The smug atheist proudly misquotes the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, thinking that mankind has advanced beyond the need for such fantasies such as God. He is blissfully unaware, however, of the fact that it is a pillar and cornerstone of the Christian faith that God did indeed die and we did indeed kill him it was God on that cross it was the maker who died for his creation's sin it was we who struck the blow that killed our gracious master on this day the whole of Christianity confesses our God is dead, and we killed him. The seventh and final word from the cross. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun was darkened. Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, I God. He has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not his from him, but has the He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Loving Savior, at the moment of your death, you gave yourself into the loving hands of your Father. As we close our eyes in death, lead us to commit our bodies and souls to him who has summoned us by name and made us his own because of you and your love. Then we pray, let us depart in peace. Amen. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw this, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God.
Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses over the Sabbath, because that Sabbath was a particularly important day. They asked Pilate to have the men's legs broken and the bodies taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who was crucified with Jesus, and then of the other man. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Immediately, blood and water came out. The one who saw it has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may also believe. Indeed, these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Again, another scripture says they will look at the one they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove Jesus' body. When Pilate gave him permission, he came and took Jesus' body away. Nicodemus, who earlier had come to Jesus at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 72 pounds. They took Jesus' body and bound it with linen strips along with the spices in accord with Jewish burial customs. There was a garden at the place where Jesus was crucified, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So they laid Jesus there because it was the Jewish preparation day and the tomb was near.
your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, be given over into the hands of the wicked, and suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace.